Good morning. Thank you for being here, and I'd like to welcome you. And on behalf of Mrs. Lee, myself, and all our VPA fifth grade students, we would like to welcome you to our Walnut Elementary Spotlight on History, American Revolution, presented by our fifth grade VPA students. So sit back, enjoy, and learn. We are honoring not only our veterans, our military, all who served, but we are learning and participating. And so sit back and enjoy and learn through our children's presentation today. Hats and hoods off, right hand over your heart, ready, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So I'd like to present our MC for today, Mr. John Stewart, Earl of Butte. Good morning. I expected a royal Scottish fanfare with the bagpipes, but the king said, Piper, no piping! <laughs> Ridiculous. Anyway, I am John Stewart, Earl of Butte, of the four greatest Scottish influencers, Gordon Ramsay, Shrek, Scrooge McDuck, and me, I am the most important. I was King George III's tutor and greatly influenced his political views. I continued to do so during the time of turmoil and unsettling of the colonies, which began the American Revolution. You're welcome. As a Scotsman, I was despised by the majority of the people in Great Britain. However, however my impact on King George III's decisions during the seven years of conflict guiding England's policies. Join me as we reenact the events of the American Revolution. We will now hear from His Majesty's King George III and two of the rebels who have opposing points of view, Patrick Henry and Roger Sherman. Greetings, I am King George III. I was the leader of the British Empire and the longest reigning monarch England ever had. I felt that the American colonies England set up were under my control. The Americans demanded certain freedoms, but with the support of Parliament, I would not hear of it. My advisors passed laws to tax the colonies, and since the rebels continued to cause problems, I sent troops to America to stop the revolution. The die is now cast. The colonies must either submit or triumph. We must not retreat. Greetings, I am Patrick Henry. I served as the first governor of Virginia and supported the colonies fight for freedom from the tyranny of King George III. Even so, I opposed ratification of the United States Constitution, stating it gave too much power to a national government, but did help influence the creation of the Bill of Rights. I was outspoken against the Stamp Act and believed colonists should only be taxed by their own legislators. I gave a speech which convinced leaders to prepare troops from Virginia for war. I know what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. The Constitution is not an instrument for the government to restrain the people. It is an instrument to restrain the government. Good morning, my name is Roger Sherman. During the Revolutionary War, I served in the Continental Congress. I helped write the Declaration of Independence along with Thomas Jefferson. I also played a part in the writing of the Articles of Confederation in 1777, which was our new country's first constitution. After the war, I signed the United States Constitution. The question is not what rights naturally belong to man, but how they may be most equally and effectively guarded in society. Thank you, gentlemen. 
a round of applause. Shut it! Then came the first battles of the American Revolutionary War. Those 13 ungrateful colonies were not happy about taxation without representation. We had to tax the colonies to pay for the protection they received during the French and Indian War. How dare they take arms against the king? Before we watched the reenactment of the first battle of the American Revolution, Lexington and Concord, we will hear from the first brave patriot who lost his life for freedom and the man who warned the colonists that the British regulars were coming. This is Crispus Attucks and Paul Revere. I am one of the first patriots killed in the early fight for independence. I worked as a sailor and rope maker in Boston. On March 5, 1770, when the British soldiers were mistreating colonists, I led a rally march against them. And when somebody in the crowd yelled, fire, I, I got shot twice in the chest by the British. This event became known as the Boston Massacre. After my death, patriots reminded each other of my British sacrifice, and I became a symbol for the African-American abolitionist movement. A brother indeed is a brother indeed. Good morning. I'm Paul Revere. I was a silversmith and artist engraving an illustration towards the Boston Massacre, which Crispus and Tux and four others were killed by British soldiers. I, I was a, call, a courier for the American revolutionaries, delivering important information to patriot leaders. I, I, along with William Dawes and Samuel Prescott, spread the alarm that the British regulars were coming. I felt it was my duty to warn to warn John Hancock and Samuel Adams that the British were planning to arrest them in Lexington. The colonists armed themselves against the British troops and fought in battles at Lexington and Concord. I was stopped by the British a few miles beyond Lexington and never made it to Concord. There's a time for casting silver, a time for casting cannon. If that isn't red, it should be. Ride the horse. The regulars are out. The regulars are out. Arm yourself. The regulars are out. The regulars are arm yourselves. And now the battle of Lexington and Conquer. The thirteen American colonies were not happy about the rule of King George the Third. British regular soldiers were sent to make sure the colonies obeyed the rules and laws set by the King and the British Parliament. On March 5, 1770, a group of colonists led by Crispus Attux threw snowballs with rocks inside at the British soldiers. The soldiers fired and shot five colonists, killing Crispus Attux. After the Boston Massacre, the colonies decided the only way to make their own laws was to fight the British. The battles of Lexington and Concord were the first battles in the American Revolutionary War. On the night of April 18, 1775, British Lieutenant General Thomas Gage gathered 700 English soldiers and prepared to march into Concord, Massachusetts. He was hoping to prevent the Minutemen from gathering weapons, as well as stop Paul Revere and any other colonial messenger from warning the countryside of the approaching Redcoats. The regulars are out! The regulars are out! Arm yourself! The regulars are out! The regulars are out! Arm yourself! <laughs> At about 4 a.m., the colonists prepared for battle and joined Captain John Parker at the Lexington Green. After seeing the 700 British regulars, Captain Parker shouted orders to his militia. Men, spread out! Spread out! Spread out! Spread out! The British troop marched toward the American Minutemen. No one knows who fired the first shot. Who fired? Thank you. 
overpowered the American Minutemen at Lexington. They continued to march to Concord, where the battle would continue. Minutemen joined the militia, preparing to defend the North Bridge in Concord. The colonial troops increased to around 2,000 men. The British continued to march to Concord in order to destroy weapons and ammunition. When they arrived, another battle took place. Oh no! The American Minutemen continued to fire at the English soldiers, even running ahead and firing upon the Redcoats as they approached. The colonists were not following the rules of battle, which angered and frightened the British soldiers. The British soldiers began to retreat toward Boston Harbor. Charlestown near Boston on the evening of April 19, 1775. The colonists decided to stop their attack on the British. After the battles at Lexington and Concord, the British lost 73 men, 174 were wounded, and 26 soldiers were missing. The colonists lost 49 Minutemen, 40 were wounded, and 5 were missing. Even though the battles were finished, the American Revolution had just begun. The 13 American colonies proved they could stand up to King George III. Lexington and Concord became known as the shot heard around the world. After the battle, the rebels united. They decided to come together and join or die. They were going to fight to the death. Against all odds, they were ready to fight for a representation against the king, who gave them everything they had. How could they? England had a powerful army. They could not unite. The Americans had a small militia made up of farmers and untrained citizens. They would not win. Here are three influential patriots in the writing of the Declaration of Independence. Samuel Adams, Thomas Jefferson, in Robert Livingston. Before the American Revolution, I wrote many articles opposing British rule. I also wrote a letter to King George that went around the 13 colonies, which led to the boycott of English goods. I helped establish the Sons of Liberty with John Hancock and Paul Revere. We organized the Boston Tea Party to protest taxes imposed by British Parliament. And as a delegate from the colony of Massachusetts, I signed the Declaration of Independence. I, wrote all, I also wrote many articles in Boston newspapers to, pro, to promoting the idea of freedom from Great Britain. After the war, I became the governor of Massachusetts. The liberties of our country, the freedom of our constitution are worth defending against all hazards, and it is our duty to defend them against all attacks. Greetings, my name is Thomas Jefferson. I was the main writer of the Declaration of Independence along with Benjamin Franklin and John Adams. I was a shy law student when the idea of independence was being considered. I was an advocate of boycotting British goods. I created the American coin system. I started the Library of Congress, the University of Virginia, and the Democratic Party. I was appointed America's first Secretary of State. After the war, I became Minister to France after Benjamin Franklin. I became the third president of the United States. As president, I authorized the Louisiana Purchase, which doubled the size of the country. I prefer dangerous freedom over peaceful slavery.
Greetings. I am Robert Livingston. I was a lawyer and a member of the Continental Congress. I was one of the sons of the Liberty Active and the Stamp Act Revolt. I helped write the Declaration of Independence along with Thomas Jefferson and Roger Sherman. I was elected Secretary of Foreign Affairs until 1783. I, I administered the presidential oath when George Washington became the first president of America. I negotiated the Louisiana Purchase when uh, I negotiated the Louisiana Purchase under Thomas Jefferson's presidency. We have lived long, but this is the noblest work we've ever done. United States tank ranks this day among the first powers of the world. After the Battle of Lexington and Concord, the colonists were angry. Britain felt our efforts to subdue the colonies were successful. The British militia was ordered to maintain control of the colonies, but the colonists would not have it. Another battle was arising in 1775 at Bunker Hill. Let's watch the reenactment re of this battle. On June 12, 1775, shortly after the Battle of Lexington and Concord, General Thomas Gage, who was the English governor of Massachusetts, declared martial law in the city of Boston. <laughs> Under his direction, British regulars set up barricades around the city and government buildings. The colonists were angry and frustrated by the actions of General Gage. They outnumbered the English troops and gathered around the city. General Gage realized he could be attacked at any time by colonial forces and needed to, to take control of Dorchester Heights and Charleston, both near Boston. General Artemis Ward, commander of the colonial troops, learned the English plan and decided to, to defend Boston in the Battle of Bunker Hill. When the colonial troops reached Bunker Hill, Colonel Prescott changed his mind and chose to fortify the smaller Breach Hill, which was next to Bunker Hill. What? Around midnight, the men began the difficult work of digging trenches and building a redoubt, a mound of dirt with branches, mud, and barrels in front to make a solid wall to protect the troops. England had the largest, most powerful navy in the world. Early in the morning on June 17, 1775, sailors on the Lively, a 20-gun warship, saw the American redoubt on Breed Hill and began firing. Many of the colonists had never experienced battle and were frightened by the cannon fire.
While General Ward was encouraging his troops to be brave even in the face of overwhelming odds, British General Gage watched them nearby and prepared his men for battle. The colonial army let the British regulars get very close before firing, wounding, or killing many of the officers as well as the English soldiers. General Gage ordered a second attack on the Minutemen, but it proved deadlier for the British army than the first one. Unfortunately, the colonial soldiers were running out of ammunition. Later the same afternoon, the regulars made their final charge up Breed Hill. The colonists ran out of ammunition, fought with bayonets, and used their muskets as clubs. The Minutemen were overpowered by the British. After gathering at Bunker Hill, the colonial army continued to retreat beyond Charleston in order to get away from the British who were firing on the town, setting a number of the town's buildings on fire. The British took control of both Bunker Hill and Breed's Hill. Although a loss for the American army, the English suffered more than 1,100 casualties. The American colonies proved to General Gage and King George the third, they could organize an army and stand up to the British fighting forces. On July 3, 1775, General George Washington took over the command of the American troops surrounding Boston. By now, the colonists were in unrest. Rebel leaders were rising amongst all 13 colonies. Many spoke about establishing a constitution and setting up a congress. Many of the wives stood behind their husbands as well. Everyone was in the fight for independence. Let's hear from some of the writers of the Declaration of Independence, as well as those who influenced the concept of independence. John Adams, John Hancock, Thomas Paine, Mary Draper and Abigail Adams. Greetings, my name is John Adams. As a member of the Continental Congress, I played a leading role in the writing and adoption of the Declaration of Independence. My wife Abigail and I were outspoken on the separation from Great Britain. I was critical of Britain's taxes on the colonies, declaring the tariffs oppressive. I nominated George Washington to be Commander-in-Chief of the Colonial Forces. Along with Benjamin Franklin, I negotiated the Treaty of Paris. I was the first vice president of our new country and was elected the second president of the United States in 1797. Without the pen of the author of Common Sense, the sword of Washington would have been raised in vain. Greetings, I am John Hancock. I was a delegate from Massachusetts who, ser who served as the president of the Second Continental Congress from 1775 to 1777. I objected to the taxes imposed by the British and was wanted for arrest because Britain accused me of not paying taxes on a shipment of cargo. My wealth and influence enabled me to aid the fight for independence. 
I was the first to sign the Declaration of Independence. I wrote my name very large so that King George III wouldn't have to wear his glasses to see my name. The British considered Samuel Adams and me to be, to be, the, most, um, to be the most dangerous American revolutionaries. There. His Majesty can now read my name without glasses and he could double the reward on my head. Greetings. I am Thomas Paine. I was an English-born American who wrote a pamphlet called Common Sense, which was the first publication to convince colonists to take up arms against Great Britain. I also wrote the American Crisis during the Revolutionary War, which General George Washington read to his troops to encourage them in their fight for freedom. I believe that American survival depended on a break from England, and I also felt that slavery was wrong and wrote about freeing the enslaved African Americans. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of the country. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. I wanted to help the colonies during the American Revolution. Hello, I'm Mary Draper. I wanted to help the colonies during the American Revolution, but have a little skill for fighting. I lived on a large farm and decided to use the bounty from our fields to supply marching soldiers with bread, cheese, and cider set on a table in front of my home. After the battle at Bunker Hill, ammunition was short in supply, so I decided to melt down all my family's pewter heirlooms. The metal made wonderful musket balls for the soldiers. Many of the soldiers needed shirts and coats, which, of the help of my daughter, we sewed from cloth I had set aside for my family's use. I knew the fight for freedom was more important than my family's things. Food must be prepared for the hungry. For before tomorrow night, hundreds, I hope thousands, will be on their way to join the Continental Forces. Some who have traveled far will need refreshments, and you and I will Molly, with Molly will feed as many as we can. Good morning. I'm Abigail Adams. As the wife of John Adams, our second president, I strongly supported education for women, even though I had no formal schooling. I worked hard to become a strong reader and writer. During the war, I managed our family in Massachusetts, taught our children, and expressed my political views in letters written to my husband. I was my husband's key political advisor during the war and while, I was president, and while he was president of the United States. Learning is not attained by chance. It must be sought for with ardor and attended to with diligence. Thank you. There's nothing better than hearing from the people who aim to destroy you. The Second Continental Congress appointed George Washington as general to lead the American army. George Washington and his wife Martha Washington supported and provided his militia. I don't know what that device is. Uh, with training, confidence, and encouragement, all of which were needed to continue to fight for independence. Let's hear from the Washingtons and Mercy Otis Warren, who wrote a poem to George Washington during this difficult time. George Washington, Martha Washington, Mercy Otis Warren. Good morning. My name is George Washington. I strongly support the colony's independence from Great Britain, especially in the light of taxes imposed by King George III. I was a delegate to the First Continental Congress in 1774 and was appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army in 1775. I came from a good family and worked hard all my life. I fought many battles alongside my troops and even helped to finance the Continental Army and the Navy. After the war, I became the first elected President of the United States of America. First in battle, first in peace, first in the hearts of my countrymen. Experience teaches us that it is much easier to prevent an enemy from posting themselves 
than it is to dislodge them after they have already got possession. Good evening. My name is Martha Washington. Until I married my husband, George Washington, I had never gone outside of the colony of Virginia. I spent half of the war near the Army's camps with my husband. I spent the cold winters at Valley Forge and Morristown. I organized colonial women to seek donations of money, fabric, and food to help supply the soldiers fighting for our freedom. Many women of the camp sewed shirts, knitted socks, and mended clothes. My, so my presence lifted the spirits of my husband and the colonial soldiers. The greater part of our happiness happens, uh, our misery depends on our dispositions and not our circumstances. On, we carry the seeds of the one or the other about with us or in, in our minds wherever we go. Greetings. My name is Mercy Onis Warren. I strongly supported America's fight for freedom, often hosting members of the Sons of Liberty in my home. I believe in natural rights for the colonial citizens. I am an author writing many plays and poems, promoting the patriot cause. I also wrote many letters where I advised many, many of our founding fathers, including George Washington and John Adams. I was good friends with both of their wives and corresponded frequently. My writing influenced many and brought awareness to women's issues and furthered America's cause. Drawing on my experience and notes, I wrote the first history of the American Revolutionary War, published in 1805. The rights of the individual should be the primary object of all governments. The Washingtons. Uh, the least favorite family in England. By the winter of 1776, many battles were lost by the mil American military. The morale of the colonial soldiers was low. The British were happy and thought perhaps the Americans would back down and England would finally win. Trenton and Valley Forge proved to be a turning point, reigniting the determination of the colonies. Let's watch the success of the American troops at Trenton and Valley Forge. The Battle of Trenton took place less than six months after the American colonies declared independence from Britain. The British troops lost many battles to the American Continental Army, Massachusetts, and decided to fight in New York, hoping to cut off the New England colonies from the Middle and Southern colonies. Britain hired German Hessian mercenaries to help put down the revolution in the colonies. General George Washington was commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. Unfortunately, for the American militia, many battles in New York were lost to the British regulars and Hessian soldiers. In November of 1776, Washington and his army retreated to Pennsylvania to escape the English troops. British General Charles Cornwallis had ordered the English army to establish winter quarters in New Jersey towns. Usually the fighting stopped during the cold winter months in order to wait for the better weather to continue the war. Major General Cornwallis did not expect the American militia to attempt any fighting during the harsh winter. On December 25, 1776, General Washington and his army crossed the Delaware River into New Jersey. A winter storm was raging as Washington and his army prepared for the surprise attack on the town of Trenton, New Jersey. The militia crossed the Delaware River in the middle of the night and began their march toward Trenton at 4 a.m. Washington planned to attack on December 26, 1776. Because 
of the storm, the Hessian soldiers did not send out patrols to look for enemies. The bad weather also helped hide the American troops as they marched the nine freezing miles toward Trenton. General Washington, along with Mayor General Green, Major General Green, and Major General Sullivan surrounded Trenton, taking the Hessians by surprise. Nine miles! Many of the Hessians tried to escape through an apple orchid across a bridge and creek, but were surrounded by Americans and forced to surrender. <laughs> the American army took about 900 Hessian prisoners. The American colonies celebrated Washington's victory in Trenton, and he became a hero. Many colonists had renewed hope of winning their independence from Britain, and many soldiers in the Continental Army re-enlisted and continued to fight for their freedom. Hooray! Hooray for freedom! Wow, attacking on Christmas. That's a cheap shot. We hadn't even had time to play with our toys. All right. Several patriots used their skills to instill the belief in freedom from England throughout the American colonies. James Madison, John Paul Jones, and Deborah Sampson will share with us their part in the fight for independence. Greetings, my name is James Madison. As a member, I co-authored the Federalist Papers with Alexander Hamilton, which promoted the ratification of the United States Constitution. As a member of the Continental Congress, I helped write the first drafts of the, of the Constitution and Bill of Rights. I founded the Democratic Party with Thomas Jefferson. I fought for religious freedom and individual rights. I was elected the fourth American president. Knowledge will forever govern ignorance, and to people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves to the power which knowledge gives. Greetings. My name is John Paul Jones. I was America's first, I was one of America's first great naval officers. My flagmanship, Bonhomie Richard, Bonhomme Richard, named after Benjamin Franklin, attacked a British warship, the HMS Spears, on the North Sea in September 1779. When my ship began to sink, the British demanded my surrender. I shouted, I have not begun to fight yet. We ran the Spears and threw a grenade on board, capturing the British ship and winning the battle. I became one of the founders of the U.S. Navy. An honorable peace is always was my first wish. I could take no delight in the affection of human blood, but if this war shall continue, I wish to have the most active part in it. Greetings, my name is Deborah Sampson. As a young woman, I dressed myself up as a soldier named Robert to fight in the Continental Army. I was assigned to scout neutral territory in Manhattan to assess British forces. I was part of a raid on Tory home in which 15 men were captured. I participated in the siege at Yorktown, digging trenches and storming Redoubt. I was wounded twice, but nobody found out that I was a woman. 
A doctor finally discovered my secret when I became ill and lost consciousness. I was released, honor I was released honorably from the military. After the war, with help from Paul Revere, Congress granted me retirement money for my services. Later, I became a teacher and toured the colonies where I enjoyed telling my experiences as a soldier. Why can I not fight for my country, too? Some historians say this next battle was the turning point for the American colonies. I think American General Gates and his militia were lucky. I knew if British General Burgoyne could control the Hudson River, we would win the war. But we did not succeed. Observe and learn how General Gates defeated the English soldiers at the Battle of Saratoga. The Battle of Saratoga was fought in the fall of 1777. This was the first major battle won by the Americans so far in the Revolution. British General Lieutenant John Burgoyne believed that if England could control the Hudson River Valley, they could win the war. With the help of British General William Howe, they planned to capture Albany, New York. This plan did not succeed because it was disrupted by two battles near the town of Saratoga, New York. On September 13, 1777, General Burgoyne and his troops, his troops began to cross the Hudson River. Cross the river! On September 17, 1777, the American, so the American soldiers were patrolling the area, found the British soldiers in a field on Freeman's farm, just on the other side of the Hudson River. The colonial army killed and wounded several redcoats and captured 20 regulars, which they took as prisoners. Then, on September 19, 1777, the British t decided to attack the Continental Army. But the English troops had broken up into smaller groups, and the Americans outnumbered them and retained control of Freeman's farm. The troops should be on the way. We must fortify our position, build street and dig trenches. General Burgoyne waited three weeks for reinforcements, but help never arrived. The English were running out of food, their horses were dying from hunger, and many British soldiers ran away. The American forces were gaining strength as 3,000 more militia joined the fight. And on October 7, 1777, the Continental Army began to fire on the British. On the night of October 8, 1777, Burgoyne and his troops retreated north. It rained heavily and slowed the British movement. By the next morning, American soldiers had taken position on the east side of the Hudson River, which prevented the British from escaping. Not only were the Americans on both sides of the river, they were also blocking the roads that led north, so any escape by the British was impossible. 20,000 American soldiers surrounded Burgoyne's 5,000 English and Hessian soldiers. On October 13, 1777, General Burgoyne sent a message to General Gates. Major General Gates and General Burgoyne to the, agreed to the terms of surrender. 
the British troops were to return to England and not be allowed to continue to fight in the revolution. At 2 p.m. October 18, 1777, the English and Hessian soldiers stacked their weapons along the west bank of the Hudson River. After dining with General Gates, General Burgoyne and his troops returned to England. France was impressed with the American victory at Saratoga and agreed to become an ally of the colonies. The Battle of Saratoga was a turning point for the colonies in the American Revolution. Victory at Saratoga! Some may say this American general is a traitor. Some may say he's a hero. It depends on your point of view. Then we have the young lady, Betsy Ross, who is the best seamstress known, as well as a wealthy Frenchman, Marquise La de, de Lafayette, who helped train colonial troops during the American Revolution. What do all these rebels have to say, along with Benedict and Major John Andre? Let's hear from them. Greetings, I'm Benedict Arnold. I'm considered one of the worst traitors in American history. I played an important role in the battles of Fort Terracon Ticonderoga and Lake Champlain in Saratoga. I became angry with General Washington and Congress because I did not receive the recognition, promotion, or money I felt I deserved. As a result, I sold secrets about American troops and movements to, as, as a result, I sold secrets about American troops and movements to Major John Andre, Andre a British officer, for 20,000 pounds. I flee America and escape to England, but never received the full amount of money I was promised. Let me die in the old uniform I fought, which I fought my battles for freedom. May God forgive me for putting on another. My name is Marquise de Lafayette, and I, and I was a Frenchman who heard about the American fight for independence. I want to help Soy to fight a royal French order prohibiting French officers from, from participating in the revolution. I volunteered, to join, I volunteered to join the colonists in their fight for freedom, and the Continental Congress assigned me to assist General Washington at Valley Forge. I spent much of my own fortune to assist the American army. I was wounded at the Battle of Brandywine, 1777. Returning to France a hero. I helped convince, I helped convince the, King of Fran uh, the King of France to join the fight and, and help the Americans. True republicanism is the sovereignty of the people is the sovereignty of the people. There are natural and imprescriptible rights that an entire nation has no right to violate. Ross. I am credited for selling the first, first official American flag in, eight, in 1870. My grandson told the story of how. In 1776, George Washington and two other men from Congress came to my house asking for my help. Con Washington showed me a design of a six-pointed star, but I took a piece of paper, folded it, and with a single snip of my scissors, produced a symmetrical five-pointed star. I sewed the flag shortly after the visit. During the Revolutionary War, I was a seamstress and a poster, making tents, uniforms, and more flags. Congress adopted the national flag on June 14, 1777, is now known as Flag Day. Today, the American Knights hold the commercial supremacy of the world. Greetings, I am Major John Andre. I was head of Britain's Secret Service. I participated in the battles of Brandywine and Monmouth. I wrote a journal about the Revolutionary War from the British point of view. During the war, I lived in Benjamin Franklin's house during the British occupation of Philadelphia, looting it when I left. 
I negotiated the surrender of West Point with Benedict Arnold. I was hanged as a spy for helping Arnold on October 2nd, 1780. As I suffer in the defense of my country, I must consider this hour as the most glorious of my life. Remember that I die as becomes a British officer, while the manner of my death must reflect disgrace upon your commander. After the success at Saratoga, General Washington kept rallying his troops and gaining strength. The fight near Philadelphia was strong, and that Lafayette, how dare he continue to help the Americans? We had so much money he didn't know what to do with it but to help them. Now, let's watch the Battle of Monmouth. Even though the Americans surrendered New York City in 1776, General Washington's troops continued to gain strength. And by the winter of 1777, the Continental Army numbered 10,000 soldiers. Later that spring, May 1778, France agreed to help the colonies in their fight for freedom from England. France sent money, weapons, and men to help the war. Major General Lafayette how General Washington trained the American soldiers during the harsh winter at Valley Forge. On May 18, 1778, Washington sent Lafayette to engage the British near Philadelphia. Viva la General Clinton knew if he defeated the Americans, it would be difficult for the Continental Army to regain strength. The determination of the Continental Army surprised General Clinton, and he stopped the attack because he was concerned Lafayette may have more men than the English originally thought. The break in the battle gave Lafayette time to retreat to safety. On June 18, 1778, after General Clinton and his troops left Philadelphia, General Washington and his 10,000 soldiers took over the city and decided to chase the regulars. It took almost a week for Washington to catch up to the Redcoats. On June 26, 1778, General Clinton stopped in the town of Monmouth, New Jersey, and General Washington decided to attack the rear guard of the English army. On June 27, 1778, Washington ordered his men to prepare for battle. While the Continental Army was preparing to attack, the British regular army began moving again toward New York City at 4 a.m. on June 28, 1778. By 7 a.m., the colonial force got into position to attack. As the rear guard began to leave Monmouth Courthouse, they protected the rest of the regular army from the colonial soldiers and surrounded the Minutemen. Both armies fought hard in the intense summer heat. Many men died from exhaustion. 
The armies traded control of the battlefield for most of the day. Officers de decided to take a brief break to try and determine what to do in order to win the battle and give the tired armies a much needed rest. When the fighting resumed, neither side was able to gain control. The soldiers became so tired that by 8.30 p.m., both Washington and Clinton ordered those men to pull back. During the night, General Washington prepared a plan to attack at dawn. General Clinton did not want to continue the battle and ordered his men to leave New Jersey and continue on to New York. The regulars were so quiet that Washington and Lafayette did not realize they had left and the Battle of Monmouth ended with neither side winning. The Battle of Monmouth was the largest one-day battle of the American Revolutionary War and proved the Continental Army was powerful enough to fight the British Army. Oh, All right, give it up for that battle. Now it was said that the role of women was crucial during the war. Sometimes their contribution was forgotten, but remains an important part of the colony's fight for independence. They fought on the battlefield right alongside the soldiers. Now they tell us their story. Let's hear from Mary Ludwig Hayes. Nancy Morgan Hart and Phyllis Wheatley. Good morning. My name is Mary Ludwig Hayes. I enlisted in the Army and went to battle with my husband on a hot June day in 1778. I washed clothes and cared for the sick and injured soldiers. During the Battle of Monmouth, I helped the soldiers by bringing water to the weary Army. The men called me Molly Pitcher and considered me brave and hardworking. When my husband was wounded, I took his place behind his cannon and fired round after round at the British. After war, Congress granted me a pension of $40 a year. I put no claims either for happiness or gratification or even the common comforts of life. Yet surely I had a right to exist. Good morning. My name is Nancy Morgan Hart, and I fought battles of the Revolution my daughter home as well as spying on the British and capturing English loyalists. Dressed as a man and pretending to be Sun Nile, I often entered British camps gaining information which I passed on to the American troops. Once five Tories came to my home, killed the last turkey, and then demanded I prepare a meal for them. I tricked them by giving them drinks of corn whiskey and started taking their muskets. Once they discovered my plan, I held them at gunpoint. I sent my daughter to get my husband and neighbors, who then took away my prisoners. I earned a nickname War Woman from the local Cherokee tribe. Greetings, my name is Phyllis Wheatley. I was one of America's, America's, America's first poets and first African American to publish a book signed by John Hancock. As a young girl, I was kidnapped and brought to live in the colonists as a slave. The Wheatley's family named me Philippines after the ship that brought me to America from Africa. They treated me as their own daughter and encouraged my talent for writing by providing a good education for me. I wrote poems about my faith, famous people, and the fight for independence from England. After the siege of Boston, I wrote a poem about George Washington, which Thomas Paine published. Washington enjoyed it so much, I was invited to read it to him. I gained my personal freedom shortly thereafter. The world is a severe schoolmaster, for it frowns are less dangerous than it smiles and flatters, and it is a difficult task to keep in the path of wisdom. American women, that's why we lost the war. <laughs> Only an American woman would watch her husband get shot and then pick up a musket and start firing. It's ridiculous. 
The final huzzah was when the British surrendered to George, General George Washington in Yorktown, Virginia. Yorktown is 20 miles from Jamestown, Virginia, our first permanent American colony. So 172 years later, and only a short distance away, British General Charles Cornwallis, genius, surrendered to the Americans on October 19, 1781, ending the Revolutionary War. Let's hear from both the British and American generals who fought at Yorktown. This is Charles Cornwallis, General, and General Rochambeau. Greetings. I am General Charles Cornwallis, and I am the last leader of the British troops during the American Revolutionary War. I captured New York in 1776 and defeated George Washington at the Battle of Brandywine. I was in charge of fighting in the southern colonies and defeated many of their colonial forces, and then marched north. While waiting for supplies, my troops and I became surrounded in Yorktown, Virginia, and after many days of fighting, I surrendered. The British loss won the war for the Americans. Against so powerful an attack, we cannot hope to make a very long resistance. Greetings. I am General George Washington, no, General Rochambeau. Major, I was a French military leader who was in charge of all the French forces fighting the American Revolution. Working closely with George Washington, I assisted the Americans in defeating the British leader, General Charles Cornwallis, at the Battle of Yorktown in, Washington, in October 1781, with the combined efforts of General Washington's 8,845 troops and my 7,800 men. We surrounded the British and forced them to surrender after the war ended. George Washington said of me, I cannot but acknowledge the infinite obligations I am under to His Excellency, the Count de Rochambeau, and all the French officers for the ass assistance in which they afford me. Using the French as dirty. Now, for our final reenactment, the Battle of Yorktown. In the winter of 1779, France joined the American Revolution, providing money, weapons, and soldiers. French General Rochambeau helped train the Continental Army alongside George Washington. Because of the aid from France, colonial troops far outnumbered the British troops. After the French joined the war, Britain decided to fight in the southern colonies. In August of 1781, General Cornwallis was ordered to create a port for the British fleet. He chose Yorktown, Virginia as the location for the port. General Washington realized that Cornwallis made a mistake and that the French fleet could keep the English ships from escaping by sea by blocking the route uh, out of the Chesapeake Bay to the Atlantic Ocean. The blockade also kept Britain from sending supplies and soldiers to Cornwallis and the British regular army. On October 9, 1781, the French and American troops fired muskets and cannons at the British for a night and day.
On the night of October 14, 1781, the French and American army attacked the British. During the fight, nine Americans and 15 French soldiers died. The number of English and Hessian soldiers who died in this skirmish is unclear, but it was higher than colonial losses. On October 19, 1781, French Gen Charles, General Charles Cornwallis surrendered. The Battle of Yorktown was over. During the battle, 156 British and Hessian so soldiers were killed and 326 had been wounded. 72 American and French soldiers were killed and 190 were wounded. News of the surrender reached the Continental Congress in Philadelphia on October 24, 1781. Many details had to be discussed before a peace treaty could be signed. Finally, on September 3, 1783, England and the United States signed the Treaty of Paris, which was negotiated by Benjamin Franklin. The United States was now a free, now was a free and independent country. After winning the fight for independence, the newly formed nation had the difficult task of setting up a government. The following people drafted and helped finalize the Constitution of the United States of America. The Constitution brought the people together and formed the country which we now live. Benjamin Franklin and Alexander Hamilton. Good morning. I am Benjamin Franklin. I was one of the most famous Americans during the Revolution. I was the first Postmaster General. I'm the oldest signer of the Declaration of Independence, which I helped write, along with five other men. Before the war, I was outspoken against taxes Britain imposed on the colonies. During the war, I go to France many times to ask for assistance of the French troops, ships, and money to help defeat the British. After the war was over, I negotiated the Treaty of Paris in 1783. There was never a good war or a bad peace. Greetings, I am Alexander Hamilton. I was an officer in war for the independence and advisor for George Washington. I fought in the battle at Yorktown and felt that a strong federal government was necessary to maintain freedom. I worked with James Madison writing the Federalist Papers in which we defended and helped win ratification of the United States Constitution. I was the first Secretary of the Treasury. On July 11, 1802, I died in a duel with Aaron Burr, vigor of the government and essential to security of liberty.
On behalf of Walnut Fifth Grade VPA, we would like to thank all parents for coming to support our presentation on America's Fight for Freedom.